All right. Well, thank you. And thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, you know, one of the nice things about doing a little bit longer format, you know, doing a three hour uh, session as we're doing today is it does give us an opportunity to dive a little bit deeper into some of the important areas that, that um, you know, we can't touch on in a shorter format. And we've realized that doing the, the post-processing, going from where Lewis had sort of shown you having the colorized uh, 3D point cloud to generating some output product is an area that um, there are uh, people coming into uh, UAB LiDAR that may not be experienced in that, that area. So uh, we're addressing that on the training side. We've put together a, a, an eight-hour web training course that kind of picks up from the two-day training that Madeline mentioned to go through some of this. And I'm going to spend the next half hour to kind of show you some of the things that you can do in TrueView Evo. I'm going to focus a lot on, on you know, doing a bare earth extraction, which is a very common thing that you want to do with these, uh, these sort of point cloud um, uh, data sets, of course. A uh, quick overview of what I'm going to cover over the next 30 minutes. I do have a few slides I want to go to. I'm going to do a little bit of theory uh, because I do think it's important when you get to this point with your data set, you need to have a little bit of background on what's happening when you do a ground classification, when you run what we call an adaptive TIN algorithm. But it's just a few slides to give you some idea of the terminology and what I'm going to be talking about. Then I'll just hop into the software and, and and go through doing a, a ground classification, explain a little bit of how we implement that through point cloud tasks, some of the review and manual cleanup and, and, and so on and so forth. If you are an experienced LIDAR person, then this will be very familiar to work that you've done either with UAV LIDAR or you know fixed wing LIDAR and, and, and so forth. So let's just dive right in. So you've got that, that nice colorized point cloud, but your client needs a bare earth dam or they need contours of the bare earth. You're going to have to do a ground filter. And we implement that in TrueView Evo using a very standard algorithm. It's called an adaptive tin ground filter. The main thing to understand, there's three parameters I want you to understand to take away from, from this, the way the, the, the algorithm works. It, it starts by creating a seed surface. We have to start somewhere. And that seed surface is, is defined by a grid. So seed sample distance, I want you to remember that term, that's basically the size of that initial grid that we use to get that initial surface. Uh, the algorithm is then going to build a, a tin surface from that, and it's going to go through and look at the other points and compare each point to that seed surface using an angle and distance test. So there's gonna be an angle and distance parameter. I want you to remember that. If that candidate point passes those parameters, then it's added to the surface. If it's not, it's ignored. And the algorithm then iterates. It rebuilds the surface with all the new points it's added and it keeps going uh, until it, it reaches a, a stop state. All of this is implemented and actually pretty simply within TrueView Evo to the point where you can just run it automatically. But we wanna talk a little bit about how that actually works because you will find that you know as you start to get more comfortable with it, you will start to take a little bit more control over how the algorithm runs. So as I mentioned, the first parameter, that seed, um, that seed surface is built by placing a grid over your data. And then the algorithm just takes the lowest point in each cell and says, this is a ground point. There's some things that related to that that you know can have some impact on 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 your results and we get into that a little bit more in our, our training but basically you're looking at a, a a sort of a low pass first estimate of your your ground surface the one issue that's important to be aware of is that seed surface uh, sorry that seed um, sample size does impact um, or does interact with for instance like buildings on your a, you know, within your project uh, site. You know, if I happen to have a building that's larger than my seed sample systems, um, I, I'm going to have issues. You can see here that cells A and B, they're fully contained on the roof of the building. Just automatically, I'm going to end up with ground points on the roof of that building. I'm going to get a bust in my ground surface. So you want to set your seed sample size to be a little bit bigger than, you know, the largest uh, feature in your data set, the largest building in your data set. Again, there's subtleties we could go into, and we do go into more in the training about that, but that's the way to think of it, a little bit bigger than your biggest building. The angle and distance, I'm not going to spend too much time on these. Uh, you will get copies of the slides, so you can look into these, but basically the angle to make sure that the point that you're looking to add to the ground is close to the surface. For true view data, we've really spent a lot of time looking at this, and we think that the two degrees is a very solid, good default setting for, for true view 410 
data. You get very nice results with, with that two degrees. These are user adjustable, should you need to play with it, but we really recommend that, that two degree default. And then there's a distance parameter as well. You'll see me talking about that. Again, for true view data, about a half meter is pretty good. And the, the main purpose of this parameter is just to make sure on larger triangles, it's not gonna jump upwards in, in, in any large way. So a little bit of theory there, um, but let's move on to the actual showing of this in the software. So uh, you guys still now seeing my true view screen? Yep. Perfect. Okay, so this is this is the same site that Lewis was showing you, the shop site, and I've got the uh, point clouds all gone through all the processing, the TrueView processing. It is actually colorized, and I've got my my by flight line uh, stuff set up there. What I'm going to be doing over the next five ten minutes, and again, I just want to kind of orient you a little bit, is running some point cloud tasks. So what we call PCTs or point cloud tasks in in TrueView Evo, and this is actually you know, one of the real benefits of building the TrueView workflow into our LP360 um, uh, architecture is you get full access to all of those um, point cloud tasks that have been built up over the years for working with point clouds, for doing sort of point cloud analysis and and, and so forth. I'm not going to go through in, in depth, um, you know, all of the details of, of what's available there. Just, just be aware there's basically a default library of tasks that come with TrueView Evo, and then these can all be customized. So you can see all of these numbered ones are ones that I've built up for my own analysis. You can create these libraries, you can uh, import and export, you can share them with colleagues, exchange them with customers and clients. It's a very effective way for building up um, a library of analysis tools, macros or scripts essentially, that let you do really interesting and useful things with the, with the point cloud point cloud data. So when I'm talking about point cloud tasks, I'm talking about running a script or running a, a macro. Um, on that. Now, I have a lot of these tasks. We have some good grouping tools in here, so I can just limit the view of what I'm looking at over here on the left side. I've just got, you know, various different categories. I just really want my true viewpoint cloud tasks. And you can see I've got a, a, a list of uh, about eight of them here to let me do the things that I want to do with, with true view. Now, I'll just mention just real briefly, because I know we do have some experienced LiDAR people here. Um, if you're coming from the airborne side, uh, if you've worked with airborne or helicopter data, um, you're probably uh, familiar with doing some low noise filtering at this point. It's related to how those seed points are picked and, and wanting to get rid of low points first. Um, we actually don't recommend that with TrueView 410 data. There's very little uh, low point noise that is significantly lower points that are gonna bust your seed surface in the data. The data is, is quite clean. Um, there is of course shot noise, and we'll talk a little bit how we deal with that a little bit later. But generally, we're not going to do any any noise filtering unless we notice in the data set we've got some issues to work with. We can actually move directly on to doing the ground classification. So to do that in TrueView Evo, it's actually really very simple. We, you've got a standard uh, TrueView ground using the default TrueView parameters I mentioned. That's already configured for you as, as a point cloud task. You just select that. And that's going to bring up this window here. These point cloud tasks are interactive. As a user, you can go in and 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 uh, you know change parameters and configure them the way that you want to be. For the most part, you know, for a ground classification, if you're using the default parameters, not really a whole lot that you need to change. So I'm not going to change many of these uh, parameters. With any of the point cloud tasks, of course, it's 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 a uh, essentially think of it as a filter. I need to give that filter some import points, so some source points, um, and then tell it what, you know, what class to put those points in if they pass the filter. If you're not familiar with classes, that's just a standard thing that people work with with LiDAR data. There's a standard class table that's part of the ASPRS LAS standard. Class two, for example, means a, means a ground point. Now, there's a lot of power in this. Um, should you need to do some additional um, uh, you know, tweaking or configuring, uh, configuring the point cloud tasks. I'm just going to pull another window over here. I can find it on my other screen, yeah. And don't worry, there's a lot going on in this, this dialogue. Don't worry too much about it. This is our live view. It's a way of looking at how you filter the data. And you can see there's a, it's very powerful. There's a lot of different things that you can filter on when you're, you're setting up, you know, what source points you want to use. Um, 
we're obviously going to use um, a particular class, the unclassified class, but what I wanted to point out here is very standard with LIDAR, you want to take advantage of the fact that you have multiple returns with the LIDAR data. And the Quantor GM8 that we use on the 410 has three returns, which is which is uh, quite unique for that class of, of LIDAR. Often they only come with just one return because they're, you know, they're designed for automotive and, and uh, you know, other applications where multiple returns aren't uh, as useful. But the quantity has got three returns and we can use that as you would with any uh, traditional airborne LIDAR to, to limit the points that we think on the are on the ground. If I've got one return and I have two other returns after it in the same pulse, then pretty much sure that first return is not on the ground. So I can ignore that and, and filter that out of here. A lot of other things that you can do there in terms of um, filtering on uh, all sorts of parameters, a very powerful tool. The only thing that I really need to tweak on a you know sort of project by project basis for true view data is that seed sample distance, as I mentioned. Uh, this data sets in meters. I've set this to uh, 25 meters. Uh, let me just uh, go back and look at the tin surface here, so it's a little bit easier to visualize. Um, I do have some buildings in this area, and the 25 meters is just a little bit bigger than the, the biggest building I have in there. Having configured the point cloud task, I would go run it. Um, typically, I would run against the whole uh, um, data set, the whole project. Uh, you can you know, run it just in certain areas. You can run it against uh, certain boundaries, uh, polygons, if you have certain areas that you want to run. Again, a lot of power there that we get in, more into in the, in the training. Um, this particular ground classification for this data set takes about two and a half minutes to run. So I'm just going to go just switch. I've got the, um, the results already pulled in from, from running it earlier. So I'm just going to go switch to that uh, LAS layer. The coloring here, by the way, if you're not familiar with, um, again, with classes within LIDAR data, it's fairly standard. The orangey brown that you're looking at is the the ground points and the, the black or gray points are points that are still in what we call the default or unclassified um, class. So again, take about two and a half minutes to run. Um, generally, of course, what you're going to do in a production environment, you're going to want to do a little bit of QAQC, a little bit of review. You want to make sure that you know the default parameters are working well for you. There's several different ways that you can uh, do that. Obviously, looking at things uh, in, in uh, profile is a good way to do this. I've got some forested area here, so I can come in and uh, take a look at one meter slice through here. So I can see what that's looking like here. It seems quite a decent job. I don't have any ground points climbing up into the trees. It's it's really kind of very nicely, um, you know, following the ground surface. This is not the thickest canopy, but it is canopy. Um, I can look across the buildings over here. Yeah, one meter should be fine. Again, so the roofs are excluded. Um, you know, it, it's it's generally done a fairly decent job in, in terms of just, you know, showing me the ground and, and only the ground. Of course, in a real production scenario, I would spend a, a bit more time than I'm going to spend here today to do this. But let's say, you know, we've, we've gone through this, we've looked at this, it looks relatively nice uh, for what we want to, what we want to do. Depending on the nature of the terrain you're surveying and the kind of project you're doing, you may find from doing this inspection that you do need to do some some cleanup or some manual editing of the ground. That's not unusual. This adaptive tin uh, algorithm that I mentioned is is really effective for a lot of things, but it can have uh, areas where it has challenges with. You can have some busts in the data. Um, you may need to go in and spend a little bit of time doing some manual cleanup, some manual editing of of the data. And we do have a bunch of tools uh, in in TrueView Evo that assist you with that. That's really nice for doing that kind of manual editing. Again, we go in, in more detail in the training and, and so forth. I'm going to show you one quick tool though um, on one area because it does give you a sense of you know just uh, how relatively straightforward it is to do these kind of cleanups. So if I'm looking here, uh, you know, the, again, the orangey brown is my ground, the gray is my unclassified. I can see that I missed a patch. Um, of, of data here. Uh, I didn't get a ground surface there, and it may be because I'm very close to an edge here. Uh, I don't have density. There may be some other reasons as, as well. But we have a nice tool that you can use if you see something like that. We just call it a cleanup tool. 
Uh, again, it's a point cloud task, so I could, um, you know, configure these things as, as I saw or wanted to do. In this case, of course, I'm not going to run it against the whole project area. I'll probably just take, um, that's a little bit big. I'm just going to use a stamp here. Uh, that's fine. Okay. I'm not sure why that backed up on me there. Let me just do this this way. I'll just do a polygon instead. So I'm just going to draw a polygon about the area that I want to uh, correct. I want to run this ground cleanup on. And for some reason, that's also not working. Okay, I'll come back to this if I have a little bit at the end. My, my main point is I wanted to um, show you there are tools that you can use to do the cleanup and you should expect to do a little bit of cleanup, especially the more complex the terrain is that you're that you're surveying. Um, you know, if you have a lot of forested areas, if you have a lot of relief in your topography, if you've got a lot of buildings large and small, the more complex the scene you're, you're scanning, um, uh, the more you'll expect to do a little bit of, of, of cleanup on everything. There's an additional step that we want to do in the workflow with TrueView that's um, it's really important, especially with, with working with, um, you know, again, what I call the automotive class of, Li of LiDAR, TrueView 410 and, and, and other kind of systems. If you've worked with data um, from these kind of systems, you know that they can have a lot of shot noise. Um, Lewis mentioned this. I think he referred to it as fuzzy. That's typically how I call it a, a, as well. It's just, they're just, uh, you know, they're very solid, very good LIDARs. Um, they're just not at the high survey grade level. Um, you know, of, a, of an Optech or a Regal system. And you see that if you zoom right in on the data. I'm just going to thicken those points up a little bit so you can see them. Let me just... Thicken those up so hopefully you can see them a little bit better. And I'm also going to just drop a grid on top of here. Um, this is a five centimeter grid. I'm not sure how well it'll be showing up over the over the, the webcast, but yeah, each of these grid squares is about five centimeters. So you can see even out here in this flat field, it is a you know it's a field, so there is some grass there. But you know I've got I've got more than 10 centimeters of shot noise. I have that fuzziness to the to the data. And really, you don't want that, especially if you're going to move on to generating some product from this. You know, if you're going to do contours or or something like that. So we've implemented uh, in TrueView Evo, and for those of you who may be a customer of ours, um, also in LP360 Advanced and LP360 SUAS a new uh, LAS smoothing uh, algorithm. This is this is quite new. You won't have it in, in your, your latest release build, but if you're interested in it, certainly let us know. We're, we're looking for uh, people to help us uh, uh, you know, get this out there and, and, and understand how it's working. It works really nicely um, on this kind of data, quantity data, or you could even use it on another system, Velodyne data or, or, or something like that. Um, again, it's run as a point cloud task. Uh, and I have it here. It's actually, the implementation I think is really nice. Um, it, it's actually a very, very simple point cloud task. There's, there's really nothing that the user needs to configure to get it to run nicely, to run properly. You basically just have to tell it what points you want smoothed, um, how you're going to select those points, and where to write or output the smooth points. So we, we create a new LAS file from the smoothing algorithm. Um, we don't uh, so you still have your original source data, and then you just basically go and, and, and run that. So I've already done that. That one takes on this data set about four and a half to five minutes on my machine to run. Um, but I'll just switch over to the, the smooth data here. And you can see visually down here, you get an immediate impact, right? So now we're below five centimeters and even better in, in some of these areas. Now this is out in the field. If I go look um, across the road here, I'm gonna use a little bit narrower profile. 
again, you do have to zoom in. It's we are talking, you know, 10 centimeter stuff. So this is the surface of the road after it's been smoothed. The gridding is five centimeters, so you're seeing very, very little residual noise on that that hard surface um, after the this the smoothing. Uh, so again, this is the, I'll go back to the unsmoothed. This is the unsmoothed on the surface of the road, 10 plus centimeters of, of noise. And this is the smooth data. So it's really, uh, really effective way to get good quality surfaces um, from, from TrueView data. And again, if you're an LP360 advanced user, you have availability. This is available at that level as well, should you want to use it with other noisy data. It works, works really nicely. So, um, so I've gone through, I've uh, generated my ground, I've done a little bit of cleanup, I'm not sure why my tool wasn't working there, live software demo, those things happen. I've smoothed my data so I have a nice uh, surface. I really want to, to um, you know, wrap up by creating some output products because as interesting and, you know, for people who are lighter enthusiasts like us, as interesting as all of the front end stuff is and, and getting the colorized point cloud and so forth, at the end of the day, you know, you want to be generating a product that um, someone is going to pay you for, something that they're going to want to use. So there's a variety of ways that you can output different products from your point cloud uh, in TrueView Evo. I want to show you the export wizard, which is where the products are generated, but I'm not going to generate a whole bunch of them here. I've got some examples I'll show us, but the, the actual exporting is the same same uh, approach. So the export wizard is just a tool up here. Again, very flexible in terms of what you may want to output uh, from your data set. Uh, we support both outputting the surfaces, of course, if you want to do contours or uh, a dem or something like that, you can do that from a surface, of course. You can also choose it to output um, your points should you need to write out your points in a different file or for a certain area, that, that kind of thing. Uh, different surface types, as again, we can do a dem. I'm actually going to generate one of those, show you those, slope, aspect, hill shades, contours. You can even just do an RGB ortho from the point cloud data if you want. Um, that's using a tin surface. Um, we use a slightly different approach, just use looking at the points within a grid cell, and you can do things like a density image uh, or a DC image, which are really eff effective analytical tools uh, for looking at the quality of your data, the density of your data, and so forth. So, so you have quite a, a, a selection there of what you want to um, generate. And then for each of the types, there's usually some selection of the different file formats um, that you may have available. Once you've got that set, you can set a filter here, just as we did with the ground class. So for instance, if I want to do contours of just my ground, I'll just select ground. Um, if I wanted to do some hill shade of my vegetation or something like that, I could do that. So you have all of that same filtering ability within the, the source points there. And then it's really um, just indicating where you want to output this, this data. Um, generally on a small site, you know, you're going to just go at, output it for the full layer, but you can use other options. You know, you can zoom in on an area and say, just, you know, output for my map view. You can uh, draw a window where you want it outputted. Uh, you can even, you know, cookie cut by polygons. A lot, a lot of options there for what you what you want to do. You can also load and save these settings. So if you've got a certain product that you always generate at the end, contours is a good example, or a dem, uh, you can save your standard settings for those and just, just pull those out. And then it's very straightforward, just telling it where you want to save that data and whether or not you want to put that data back in the map. So of all the products, um, I'm going to show you a couple of them here. It's it's the exact same export wizard. You just follow along with that and, and go ahead and um, uh, generate and output it. So um, for example, the contours I mentioned, um, you know, very common uh, output products. So these are, for this data set, these are uh, basically one foot contours, 33 centimeter contours. I've applied a little bit of smoothing to them. Again, if you've worked with LiDAR data, you know that the contours can get a little bit, let's say, not aesthetically pleasing. So you do want to do a little bit of smoothing. But we also smooth the ground surface uh, with our smoothing algorithm. So you do get a fairly nice set of contours. These are one foot. Um, you know, so and you can save that as a shape or a CAD file, and that can be your your output product. Um, some of the other products that um, you can push out, and I'm just going to turn off my um, I don't need my flight lines, and I don't need my 
data set just so we can focus on on the product you know i mentioned some of the raster type products for instance we can do a hill shade so here's a hill shade of my ground surface this can be really helpful in your qaqc uh, to see busts in your surface and so forth. Uh, that, so that could be very useful to generate earlier. Um, uh, we can do a density uh, map. Um, this can take a little bit to understand, but it's really straightforward. You may want to understand what the density of your points are across your project site, often for the ground surface. And you can configure that based on, you know, what values you're looking for. This particular one was generated. I wanted to make sure I had, I wanted to know the areas where I had at least 50 points per square meter on the ground. So that's any pixel that's green. And then the other colors um, show uh, decreasing the less points down to black being a void. So nothing surprising here. Although I did see that I missed these areas where I, I had busts in my ground that I didn't correct. But I can see under my canopy and so forth, I've, I've got uh, areas of void because I, I wasn't quite getting through to the ground and slightly less density in other areas. So that works nicely for that. Uh, a DZ image, um, very effective tool for looking at how well your flight line to flight line uh, are, are matching. If you're familiar with calibrating airborne LIDARs, terror match workflows, things like that, you'll be familiar with these. Basically, the way you interpret this is, is each of those pixels, if it's green, it means, I think in this case, I used uh, nine centimeters, so the ASPRS uh, standard. Uh, so it's well within that ASPRS standard for uh, for that, that digital accuracy class. Of course, anywhere you've got structure like forest or buildings, you do tend to get some red because the, the flight lines will just randomly penetrate in there. So a good analytical tool. And then I'll finish off by just talking a little bit about a DEM because we can generate a DEM um, from this. So this is a 50 centimeter uh, DEM. Uh, you can enter, output that in a variety of different uh, formats, GeoTIFF, uh, IMG, and, the, and so forth. Uh, often, you know, that's a deliverable your client may want exactly, just give me the DEM. Um, what I often like to do, uh, a very standard thing you can do as well, is I can take this DEM uh, and I can actually, it seems a little counterintuitive, but I can bring that back in um, uh, as a point dem. So I've taken my points, I've rasterized them, and then they've gone, um, generated a point dem as well. But the difference is in terms of from a product perspective, I'm not sure how well, hopefully you're seeing there, those points are now on a regularized grid. That is, I've got an elevation point every 50 centimeters apart. And that can be very effective if you're uh, either you yourself or your client is passing the product off to some downstream modeling software, uh, many of which still don't necessarily work very well with sort of these randomized uh, dense point clouds you get from LIDAR. They're looking for a regularized, uh, regularized grid um, of points, so you can output that very very quickly, very nicely from that. And again, in a variety of different formats, this one's GeoTIFF. Uh, and then where I'll just end up here is, I do kind of want to show, so this is the area that was under that canopy on the west side of the project. It's a half meter dam that's generated from the TrueView 410 data. As Lewis mentioned, no, no additional calibration was done beyond the system calibration um, uh, using the system calibration file in, in TrueView. I just did a very straightforward default ground classification. I didn't tweak any parameters. And we're still getting quite nice um, topography beneath that canopy. It's not the thickest canopy in the world, but it's definitely canopy there. You can see the stream structure, you can see some of the side channels and, and, and so forth. So I think a really good um, example of the ability to get really good quality data from a TrueView 410, something that you know um, you can generate good product from in a variety of formats, contours, dems, uh, hill shades, uh, you know, something that your customer wants that they're, they're going to pay you for. Uh, unless you know you have some of those nice customers who actually just want the full point cloud, which is which is great as, as well. Um, so, uh, that's towards the end of my half hour. Um, if we have any, uh, 